Are you interested in starting a D&D &D campaign, but you just don't know where to start? Or do you have an idea for the big picture of the campaign, but you struggle to come up with ideas for side quests or other events that may occur? Hi, I'm Woody. Welcome to the Woodland Fellowship. This is a channel where storytelling and adventure gaming meet. And so today we're going to do a, a kind of a companion video, a part two of my previous video talking about why a story might be boring and that is falling squarely at the feet of your villains. And so we learned that our villains are the engines for story conflict. And so now the natural question is, well, how do we come up with ideas for these sorts of villains, being that they are so important to the overall story? Uh, and so I'm going to be talking through five, I guess you could call them narrative classes as well as subclasses for your villains uh, in this particular video in order to inspire you and think through some other ideas there. It is worth noting, though, uh, that there are more types of antagonists that you may encounter in a story uh, that are not necessarily villains in this sense, uh, but they might still come up, and those do require really separate dedicated videos, and that are that is going to be uh, namely conflicts between man versus his environment and man versus himself, right? And so that is not the stuff I'm going to be talking about today. We're talking about purely the external drives uh, for the story. So let's just start it off. Our first uh, narrative class uh, for our villains that we're going to talk through today is the betrayer, the betrayer class. So these uh, these villains were once allies to the heroes in some way. Maybe they were heroes. Maybe they were um, a patron where they offered missions and quests and stuff like that. The reality of a betrayer class of a villain is that they have a personal uh, connection to the heroes and some sort of past uh, history there. So the subclasses that you can find for a betrayer villain starts with a fallen hero. This is uh, pretty straightforward in this. Uh, a great example of a fallen hero uh, sort of villain is that of Anakin Skywalker from Star Wars, uh, primarily Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Uh, that is really his whole arc is how he falls, and uh, the rest of the story is there, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, but you can, again, you can have a fallen hero be that betrayer. Maybe they were a fellow adventurer. Or uh, they, again, were a patron, or maybe they were tied to a character's backstory uh, in terms of maybe a, a family member or other NPC, best friend kind of, kind of twist there. The other uh, type of subclass of a betrayer is that of a vendetta. Right, they have that personal connection to the heroes. Typically, a, a villain that has the vendetta feels personally harmed by the choices by the heroes. So the heroes chose to do something or chose not to do something, and that brought about this vendetta. There's a couple great examples of this in, in other movies as well. Uh, if you think of the movie The Prestige, the character Robert Angier uh, is, a, is a great example, or uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, you have Fernand Mondego is another great example of uh, these, these villains that have this vendetta that drives the plot and how to follow through with that. So if you're thinking of creating a betrayer class villain or thinking, ooh, that'd be kind of interesting, the way to think of this, of, of how to even come up with them or deepen them, is as you're thinking about what the heroes are doing or not doing, who else could be harmed by the player's current or past actions? That is a prime candidate for, in particular, a vendetta or a fallen hero type betrayer. All right, our next class we're going to talk through is a crusader. The crusader is a true believer, where they are committed to a cause of some kind. And so the reason why they are villainous is because of that connection to that particular cause. And so the first subclass for the Crusader is the Anarchist. Now, the Anarchist uh, is an individual that is utterly chaotic, and they have this flawed ideal 
They are looking to do bad things. They're just looking to just set the world on fire. Uh, ultimately, a great example of an anarchist crusader, right? The cause of this anarchist uh, would be how the Joker in The Dark Knight portrays himself. Uh, now, there's a lot more that goes into the Joker's character, of course, uh, but as far as that film is concerned, that tends to be how he had been portrayed, right? Just wants to see the world burn, right? That has that element of the anarchist there. Uh, the other side of that coin is also a crusader, and that is an anti-villain. Uh, whereas the anarchist, as we said, was uh, is utterly chaotic. The anti-villain very often is more lawful, right? They they do want to follow within the law, um, but where their flaw is not in the ideal, but the flaw is in their drive or their pursuit of that ideal. A great example of an anti-villain in literature and in film uh, is the character Javert from Les Miserables. Right, Javert is so committed to this sense of justice, but he does have a little bit of a flawed understanding and a flawed drive of justice without mercy, to the point that that leads to his eventual downfall, right? that he cannot even come to forgive himself, uh, and, and so on. So an anti-villain is very, very interesting. Uh, it, the anti-villain is also not as common as as people might think you've probably heard of the uh the the term anti-hero right the anti-hero is usually a not a great character in terms of moral things uh but due to the situation they are forced into doing heroic things or doing the good thing right they're an anti-hero kind of an edgy hero the anti-villain is the same idea where they might have good qualities to them, but the situation forces them to become the antagonist and become a villain uh, to the heroes. They don't want to be the villain, but that is, again, their commitment to the cause, whatever that cause is, is leading them to become that antagonist and that villain. And the third type of uh, subclass for the crusader villain is the depraved. These are utterly trust untrustworthy characters. Uh, they tend to be completely self-serving, where they themselves are their own cause. Uh, a great example would be any like devilish figure that's offering, well, a deal with the devil, uh, for example, where they are offering, they might do good things or bad things, but it's all for their own purposes, their own cause, for their own gain. They are utterly untrustworthy. That is the uh, the thing there, right? Utterly untrustworthy. So the question to ask when you're creating or thinking about a crusader villain, or if you want to understand them a little bit more clearly, identify what that cause is, that they are a true believer, right? That they serve without question. The better you understand that cause, the better you can customize and understand this villain. All right, the next class of a villain is that of the monster. The monster. So the monster is inherently dangerous. Uh, and they, the monster cannot be reasoned with. And they give you really no other option but to contend with them, right? They tend to be inherently dangerous and violent. They force the heroes to respond to them. They cannot be dissuaded for different reasons. So the first subclass of a monster is that of a beast, right? That's the reason why you can't communicate with them to convince them to stop is because they're animalistic. They, that is not something that is in uh, the, the capability to, to communicate with them. Uh, and, and go from there. The next kind is a machine, right? This is where they don't actually have any will or agency, right? They just act, right? So uh, that doesn't have to be necessarily a, a mechanical element. This is just ultimately the monster uh, that is a machine. They just have their will, their agency stripped from them. Uh, and therefore, that is why they are dangerous and monstrous. And then the third kind of monster is that they are insane, right? Where they're, they are unable to grasp what is real and not real. And what makes this type of, of villain monstrous, right, is, again, that they have to be uh, in 
in acting in a way that makes it so the heroes cannot do anything but contend with them, right? Their insanity, they're violent, right? That forces them into that monstrous class of villain. So the question to understand and deepen uh, your monstrous villains is what is it about this entity that makes them monstrous, right? Are they corrupted? Is it a disease? Or is there some sort of interference, uh, natural or supernatural, with their ability to function, right? Maybe, uh, for example, if you're playing a science fiction style game, right, you have uh, AI that gets corrupted, or someone hacks in, and now you're controlling these these evil robots that are, are now programmed to uh, attack your heroes, right? It can be in that realm as well, but maybe it's supernatural with a, a possession or things like that. All of that ties into understanding and deepening your monster class of a villain. Uh, the next class, right, this is class number four out of our five classes, is that of the rival. Rivals are really, really common in uh, in literature, they're common in movies and TV shows, very common in games as well. So what is a rival for a villain? A rival is, um, is a character that oftentimes have similar or equal skills to the hero. Uh, they often are maybe even better than the heroes in, in some ways, right? And that provides a little bit of that extra conflict, makes it harder for the heroes to succeed. Uh, and rivals are often also competing against the heroes for the same sort of thing, right? A lot of times rivals uh, and the heroes are racing to achieve a particular outcome first, or they're trying to uh, acquire the same object but they have different purposes or reasons behind acquiring it. Uh, so a great uh, couple examples here. So very often, bullies. Bullies are often tied to uh, a character's backstory. Not always, but you'll often see that. Great examples of a bully would be in the Harry Potter uh, Harry Potter series. There's quite a few of them. You have Draco Malfoy, especially in the early parts, in the early books. Uh, but then he ends up being outdone uh, by Dolores Umbridge, right? She's also a bully uh, in that particular sense. And there's a lot more nuance and things that, that grow from there. But bullies are very, very common. The thing about a bully is that they they revel, they enjoy uh, that domination over those who they perceive to be weak, right? That's where they get some enjoyment from that, and that's what makes a bully stand out uh, versus some of the other types of uh, classes and subclasses for your villains, is that they really revel in dominating those they perceive are weak. Uh, the next uh, type, the next subclass of arrival is kind of twofold. It's a mirror image or a foil. Now, I kind of put these together because a foil in literature has two different forms. You have basically the identical version uh, of the hero. They have the same set of skills, same sort of things that they do. Uh, but a foil can also be the exact opposite of your, your heroes as well. The whole point of a foil is to demonstrate the differences and really make uh, some of those, those character elements for a hero really stand out. Your villains can do that the same way. So when they are a mirror image or a foil in this sense, uh, that really can draw that out from your heroes. So a great example uh, of a foil type rival in a uh, in a story is also from the first Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You have a character, uh, Rene Belloc, uh, who is very, very similar to Indy. They're trying to pursue a lot of the same things. Indiana Jones is better at the actual delving and acquiring uh, the, the artifacts and avoiding traps and so on. But Belloc is better with his networking and uh, being able to work with other groups. So that way, when Indy succeeds at acquiring the artifact, Belloc can swoop in and use the, the, uh, the influence of his various connections uh, to swoop in and just take it from him, right? And so that creates that rivalry uh, where they're always trying to vie for similar things in the racing. That's ultimately the, the element of the story. So he's a great, great example of that. 
Another version that you might see is a, a dark or alternate version of a hero, right? Uh, maybe the, this villain has a similar backstory, similar background to the heroes, but they made different choices that led them to become uh, heroic. I'm sorry, led them to become villainous in that sense, right? And so being able to see, hey, this is who I could have become, says the hero, if I had made other choices, right? And that leads to another form of rivalry. So the question to think about rivals, either to generate a new rival idea or to deepen the rival idea you might already have, is who else in this area, right? Who else in the town? Who else in this county desires similar things to the heroes, but they have opposite goals from the heroes? That way you can, again, start thinking about these rivals. Would they go after the items or their their goals directly themselves? Would they hire other people to do it? That can lead to a lot of interesting uh, different types of conflicts in your games. All right, and then the last class that we're going to talk about today is the Stranger. The Stranger. Now, the thing about the Stranger is that they're kind of the opposite of your, uh, of your Betrayer, meaning that where the Betrayer, if you recall has some sort of personal connection in the past uh, to the heroes, that they are aware of each other, and so on. The stranger is the opposite, where neither the hero nor the villain is aware of each other, at least initially. But based on each of their collective choices, it eventually puts them into this this head-on uh, collision of will, and eventually, hey, so it's you who's been disrupting all the things I want that sort of idea. Now, the stranger class of a villain is unique in that this tends to be just a starting class, and then the villain over time will then develop into and be revealed to be one of the other classes uh, and subclasses and so on. So they start out with this. So the stranger has a couple subclasses. Number one, very often you'll see them as a mastermind or a manipulator. A great example of this, a classic example, is that of a Professor Moriarty versus Sherlock Holmes. So neither of them were necessarily aware of one of the, one another, but as Sherlock Holmes was solving mysteries and was starting to sense that there's someone behind all of these different uh, crimes that were happening or attempting to happen, and as Sherlock Holmes was doing that, Professor Moriarty was aware of, hey, some someone is starting to uh, disrupt my business in these different areas, right? And eventually they are aware of each other, they meet, and they become rivals. They transition into that sense. But uh, masterminds are all about that patient planning, where they have this grand scheme, where they are playing uh, like this this narrative chess game, where as they are making moves, they're anticipating certain counter moves by the heroes, and so then they set it up so that way they can achieve their ultimate goal that way. Masterminds are great, great types of villains to utilize in your story, and oftentimes are the, the, the subclass for your big bad evil guy for the whole campaign. They tend to fall into this sort of ca uh, category, but not always. The next type of subclass for the stranger is the tyrant. This is similar to the bully, but the tyrant is only interested in either acquiring or maintaining the power and influence that they already have. They don't necessarily have to revel in the the weakness of others necessarily. They certainly can. Tyrants can be bullies. Um, but the tyrant is, again, just they are in power or they're seeking to acquire power uh, and go from there. Now, the tyrant doesn't have to be a stranger, but this paired very nicely because a lot of your starting quests where the heroes are being hired to deal with a problem oftentimes are dealing with a tyrant of some kind. It could be a, a very small scale tyrant, a tyrant that's affecting or um, you know creating problems for a particular village or town or along a highway, or they might be uh, a tyrant for a kingdom or a rival uh, like faction that sort of thing. The tyrant is that they are in power and they want to retain that power or they're trying to overthrow the current power uh, that exists accordingly. So the question 
that we can ask when it comes to creating a stranger class of villain uh, is what is a common problem that affects a nearby populace that they would require outside help? Because the stranger, again, they tend to be a very good introductory sort of villain for a, uh, for a campaign. It doesn't have to be the, the overarching big bad evil guy, but these guys tend to be uh, your starter. Because again, the players and oftentimes the characters have no real personal connection to these villains. Uh, and it just kind of grows from there. So couple things to consider as you're thinking through these five uh, villain classes. Number one, these villain classes and subclasses uh, can also be really effective in describing the antagonistic factions or organizations, right? So we're, we're looking at these as individuals, an individual uh, stranger, an individual betrayer, but thinking about that as a faction, such as a rival guild. Let's say a rival adventuring guild. Uh, they're trying to take all of your your particular guild's uh, tasks and jobs, and they're undercutting it in a in a way, and to a point that isn't or shouldn't be feasible, right? That can create some interesting conflict, or maybe a betrayer noble house. How does that affect uh, the the hero's relationship to them and all the choices that happen? So this can happen uh, and scale up and down as you need. Additionally, you probably, as you were going through these subclasses, realized that you know the subclasses aren't necessarily tied to their class, and so all of those villain subclasses I was talking about are universal, and so you can really pair them in to get some really interesting uh, sorts of villain ideas. So with that, I have created a fun little generator for you. I'm going to bring this up uh, full, full screen, so that way you can pause the screen, take a screenshot, and that way you can use this and reference uh, this uh, as you are preparing for your games and your, your sessions. The premise of this villain generator is to take all of this info that we've been talking about in this video today and give you an opportunity that if you're like, I just, I just need some ideas. This is to prompt an idea for a villain. So you just roll 1d6 and 1d12 to start. And so your d6 will give you your overall class. If you roll a 6, just re-roll it. So you'll get Betrayer, Crusader, a Monster, Rival, or a Stranger. And then your d12 gives you a subclass. So that would give you the fallen hero, a vendetta, anarchist, anti-villain, depraved, beast, machine, insane, bully, mirror, uh, or the foil, mastermind, or the tyrant. So as you roll, you can get some pretty interesting uh, situations here. Now, you start with just 1d6 and 1d12 roll, and that might be all that you need, right? Maybe you get a rival and a vendetta. Ooh, that's an interesting mix. How would you handle that? Okay, but maybe you want a little bit more texture. You want a little bit more uh, resolution, increased resolution of what this villain looks like. Roll again and then add your results uh, to the other and you might see. So a lot of times that might tell you maybe you get Stranger and um, let's do Stranger and Tyrant. Maybe that was your first one that you rolled, but then you roll a monster and vendetta. Okay, so you know that they start out as a stranger and a tyrant, but they reveal themselves to be a monster with a vendetta, right? So as the heroes are, are interrupting maybe their plans or, or desi their desire for power, they become more and more inherently dangerous, they cannot be reasoned away from it, and they have developed this vendetta against the heroes. Okay. Now you're starting to get a little bit of a sense of that direction. So if you ever get uh, duplicate uh, answers, just re-roll. And then that way you can uh, fit something that is better in your mind. So hopefully this is a helpful tool for you. That's why I put it together uh, to generate and prompt some of those ideas. If you're needing help, thinking like what are some other things that could be happening in a given village or a given city or county or region or things like that and, uh, and go from there. So let's put this all together. How then do we do this? Well, if you remember from the previous video uh, that I talked about, when you're creating your compelling villains, so regardless of what you roll in terms of using that tool, if you're going to uh, do that, you do need to identify and be specific. What is it that this villain wants? Identify that. Why do they want that? And 
how are they going to get it? Because the best villains are active. They're not passive. They're going after and they're doing stuff. And that causes the heroes to, to react to the villains' plans, right? And that really drives the plot forward. So you want your villains to be active. They're doing stuff. So let's, uh, let's get an example. Let's say the heroes come into a village, and this village, let's say this is the very first uh, episode that you're dealing with here, and you just put together a couple uh, a couple things. Maybe you roll, or maybe you have some ideas. Don't be afraid of starting with anything that you might perceive to be generic, because it's all about developing it into something that is customizable. So let's just stick with our story uh, arc A. Let's call that uh, the bandits, right? So let's say bandits are harassing a town, and so the town is looking to get some people to stand up to them uh, because the guards won't do anything, or maybe they're called off elsewhere, right? And so the heroes are needed to deal with this bandit problem. Let's say there's also another uh, story arc that can be revealed uh, the longer that the heroes stay in town, is that there's a new cult that has new, moved in, a secret cult, and they are capturing and kidnapping people. So there's disappearances, uh, or maybe they are alluring, uh, you know, unsuspecting people within the populace, maybe young folks who who are uh, disenfranchised or some of those sorts of things, right? You have maybe that aspect is going on. Or maybe for a third thing that could happen, let's say there's rumors of ogres and trolls that are uh, coming down from their homes in the mountains and they're now pillaging farms in the county on, on the far reaches from the village. And so people are starting to get worried of, hey, are they going to start coming this way or not? All right, so let's say those are the three things that the heroes are overhearing as problems happening in this village. They can choose to go after any of them, but let's just say they go after story arc A. So they're going to deal with the bandits first. Or maybe they didn't talk to any individuals or ask about uh, or finding out about the other things, but let's just say for the sake of the argument, they choose to go after story arc A, which is going after the bandits. So what is our villain there? Well, let's start with a very basic one. Let's just say we have a leader of that bandit troop, and he's just a tyrant, right? He's just a, a local tyrant uh, looking to acquire more influence and power in the area, uh, doing so by leading raids and so on along the highway, and sometimes even infiltrating the village itself. So the heroes have been uh, tasked with taking on this bandit leader and bringing proof of his demise uh, to be able to, to get that payment. Okay, pretty standard quest. What are some things that can happen while the characters are on this particular quest? Pay very close attention because you're going to be adapting your story to what the characters do. So let's say while the characters are attacking this bandit camp, one of these other bandits, not necessarily the leader, but someone else gets away. So let's just say uh, it could be either because the characters were unable to identify or recognize that someone was getting away, or maybe they let them go, or they shamed them, something interesting can happen. So this escape bandit is a awesome, awesome tool that you can use to bring back later on. So maybe this escape bandit has this vendetta. Because, hey, you shamed me, you disrupted our, our thing, you killed my friends, now I'm going to try and take you down after I maybe get some other friends together or I'm going to hunt you down. Whatever it's going to be, you can do some interesting things with this escaped bandit. All because that happened. So as you're playing the game, pay very close attention to anyone that uh, the characters might have assaulted or dealt with, but they don't. Uh, but they let them go or things like that, they can always come back a little bit later. And that makes it very interesting. So let's just follow that escape bandit for a moment. Okay, so if they're escaping, where would they go? Well, let's just say that there's other bandits that they could go to. Okay, or let's just say these bandits are aligned as part of actually this this underworld syndicate, this crime uh, syndicate of sorts. And so this bandit goes maybe to this leader, this 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 crime boss, and is looking for assistance. Hey, there are these these uh, adventurers. They came and they disrupted our our business that were happening in X Y Z area. Can I, can we get some help? Because I want to take them down. Crime boss 
can now be a mastermind, right? They're trying to run a, a whole organization. So maybe the crime boss gives that bandit uh, some, some extra thugs, some extra support. So that way that escape bandit can prove himself and they hunt down the player characters. Now, let's say this is all happening uh, off screen, right? So of course the heroes, all they know is they went through that bandit camp. They uh, dealt with anyone who was uh, like fighting them. They eventually took down that bandit leader. They go back to town and they get that reward. All right, so now you still have the other quests that we had established, right? The ogres and trolls and the, um, what, what did I say? The cult, yes, and the cult, right? The, uh, yeah, the ogres and trolls and the cult. Now, maybe that escape bandit is waiting outside the village for the next time that the heroes leave. Maybe the heroes are going to leave and then deal with ogres and trolls. And then that escape bandit can show up uh, while they're traveling. And that becomes what feels like a random encounter, but it's actually very specific. You have this escape bandit with a whole bunch of his friends are now attacking the party, maybe while they set up camp and travel uh, to the, through the wilderness. That can definitely happen. Okay. Now, what else would that crime boss do? So he sent out that escape bandit. Let's say that that escape bandit uh, is unsuccessful. He is defeated as are uh, the his friends that went along, and they're completely eliminated. Okay. The crime boss is now aware that these heroes are starting to create a disturbance to his business. He needs to be monitoring them a bit closely. So maybe he reaches out and uh, he finds the brother for that first bandit leader. And that brother is angry. They're already creating a bunch of problems. And so this crime boss reaches out to them and says, hey, by the way, I know who it is that killed your brother. And I last heard that they were over here. And so that vengeful brother could now also be tracking down the heroes. Now, of course, the heroes have no idea about the crime boss yet. They have no idea about this vengeful brother. So it could be very interesting to have that vengeful brother show up at a certain time, uh, or maybe going back to some of the the village folks that the heroes were talking to and harassing them. Uh, and so as the heroes are maybe traveling about the countryside, they're going to some other towns, and they're hearing about oh yeah, did you hear about so-and-so in such town? Uh, yeah, how their house burned down? Yeah, it was really terrible. Heard that it was arson. Oh, really? Right? Or things like that could really happen and really start putting together that there's someone who's following them uh, in their wake and is causing a whole bunch of trouble. And maybe that's making other folks leery of doing any work with them <laughs> until that gets handled. That could be very interesting uh, villain arc from him. Okay. Now, let's also say that that vengeful brother is also unsuccessful. Okay. What else would this crime boss do? Because now he's noticing anything that's going up against these guys directly is creating some problems. So the crime boss puts a plan to work. So the first thing that he's going to do, he's going to actually release this massive beast in the city. Okay. So what happens there? So this beast is uh, released in the city and is uh, just tearing through the populace. The, the city is now calling just for aid across the, across the whole region uh, for support, maybe offering a reward for anyone who can prove that you've killed that beast and so on. Lots of people are trying and dying and stuff. So the reward could be very, very lucrative. So let's say that uh, in addition to this party going after this beast, let's say there's a rival party, right? So maybe they have similar um, skill sets. So maybe your party, your party of heroes has a, a soldier and an archer and a wizard and a cleric. And then this rival party has something similar, right? Okay. Now, the, these, this rival party certainly could work together with the heroes. There's nothing to stop them from that. Maybe this rival party uh, also attacks the heroes because they want more of the reward for themselves and not have to be split among even more characters. Or you could also add it a little bit deeper. Let's just say there's a member in this rival party that's tied to one of the characters backstories. Maybe they were a bully and now they are also an adventurer and they are a member of this rival party. 
that could add a little bit of that extra edge uh, to make that whole encounter interesting because you have the beast itself which is dangerous and let's say it's huge and whatever uh, but you also have this rival party so now trying to deal with this are they going to try and handle the party first so that way they can take down the beast or are they going to try and take down the beast and then the rival party will attack them who knows there's some very interesting things that could develop there all right now Let's uh, let's keep this going. What else? What other villains could we generate to keep this story going forward? Well, let's just say that as part of that crime boss's master plan, this released beast was done in a way that implicated the heroes. Okay, so now these heroes have been framed for releasing the beast in the first place. The people in the city are now thinking, hey. Did you do this in knowing that we'd put up a reward and just wanted to get that reward? That's a problem. And so let's say you have this guard captain within this city is following the evidence where it's leading and is not interested in hearing any sort of alternative uh, responses to what that might implicate. And so he's now an anti-villain. So now you have uh, possibly members within this crime boss's organization who are hunting down uh, the heroes. You have maybe this rival party or that vengeful brother. You have the guard captain and the the other guards in the city and other you know lawful members. They could all be hunting down your heroes. And now they're like, what's going on? Right. So maybe they're taking on these different individuals. Maybe they get caught by the guard captain. There's a number of things that could happen and you just generate more villains. So let's say while your heroes are on the run, because naturally they they might run away from the guard captain and and just to get out of the city, wait for things to calm down a bit. So maybe they go back to some uh, some other members in their past. Maybe someone who uh, hired them to do things. Maybe they go back to that village where they uh, where they initially were hired to kill that bandit leader. And it turns out that that quest patron, uh, someone got to them. Or maybe uh, they were already in league with that crime boss ahead of time and they were just a rival to that bandit leader. And so they are just trying to take out the competitions. That way their influence might grow that way. So maybe they betray the heroes in that sense and call in uh, some reinforcements, right? This is the process that you, as you're just starting with something that seems pretty generic, right? Hey, deal with these bandits. As you are going through it, just generate new villains that come from the, the character's decisions, as well as, well, what would these other characters, these NPCs, what would they do? How would they follow up on this? And so you can use any of these types of villains to generate the plot for this particular story arc. So that is from story arc A that we just generated. Now, as I talked about, we had story arc B and story arc C. That same process could happen in any one of these, or maybe they ignored the bandit aspect of the story. And instead, the heroes were going after and dealing with ogres and trolls. So here's the thing to think about. As the characters are going about whatever it is that they're doing, what's happening with these other story arcs? Let time pass. Does the, let's say, while the heroes are dealing with the bandit leader, do they also find a rival party to maybe hire uh, and deal with ogres and trolls? So by the time the heroes come back, instead of having both this, you know, stories of the disappearances tied to these cultists uh, and the ogres and trolls, maybe they only have the cultists to deal with and disappearances. Or maybe that isn't discovered at all. Uh, do the bad guys in any of these stories, do they succeed? Maybe the rival party goes uh, after the ogres and trolls, but then they never return. So then that's why the heroes are then called out and go from there. So thinking about, okay, well, what are some of the villains behind each of these different story arcs? Are they able to succeed or do other things happen? And so you want to have this world develop and grow along with your, your players' choices, because that will also give that sense that the choices that the players make have meaning, because this world is not just waiting around for the heroes to do stuff. It's moving along. The world keeps spinning uh, accordingly. So to conclude, right, neither of uh, our, our villains or these you know, possible story arcs, they don't all have to be interconnected, but it certainly can be a lot of fun uh, when they are. But using this process of identifying who new villains can be, paying attention to what is it that they want, why do they want it, and what is their plan to get it, 
right? That will continue your story. That will drive the story forward. And I would also recommend having at least between three and five uh, of these possible villains that are affecting an area at a given time. Uh, and then as the heroes are dealing with a number of these, uh, these situations that arise, again, you can make some of these other things go away. Maybe they're solved, maybe they get worse. But as the players make these choices, you can really get a sense of the direction that the players are wanting to experience. And then that way, all of you are collectively generating this story together. And you don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna conclude, uh, but clearly there's a lot of options that can happen. So uh, yeah, so those are your five uh, villainous classes as well as the 12 subclasses. Uh, appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your day.